Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us on our uh, Friday lunchtime Q&A live stream. Uh, what we're trying to do here is have an interesting panel where we've got people from different walks of life uh, giving us perspectives on uh, what sort of challenges businesses are facing. Um, I, I think we're trying to have a, a flavour of uh, the glasses half full rather than the glasses half empty. So if you're looking for doom and gloom, um, this probably isn't for you. We're trying to be a little bit more inspiring and give you some positive ideas and a positive take uh, on what's going on. We don't want to be Pollyanna, but um, that's that's what we've got planned. I've got three people um, joining us today. I've got David Gandolfo, who's a finance broker in Melbourne. We've got Glenn Treble, who's um, a, a recruitment specialist. Um, well, we still like to call him headhunters. I'm not sure how he feels about that. We can check. And we've got Aaron McDonald, who is... Um, has his own law firm in Perth, so he gives us uh, a legal perspective as well as um, giving us uh, a little bit of a view from uh, from across the Nullarbor. So I'll start off by introducing um, David Gandolfo. G'day, David. How are you going? Very well, Nick. Thank you. I've got... As president of, of CAF Bogues, you've got you've got different hats that you're wearing. What's what's been keeping you busy this week? Well, it's um, okay. Specific to this week, we've there's obviously been a lot of member issues uh, that. Uh, affect all of our members and that's that's not just asset finance brokers but commercial brokers uh, or brokers in the commercial space uh, commercial property trade debt of finance etc so uh, we've been uh, in touch with all of our senior lenders and, and the lenders uh, panels and we've asked them uh, to detail eight things that um, you know are, are of concern to our members and they revolve around each of their uh, ongoing credit policies, um, clawbacks, um, their low doc products, or I hate low doc, but you know, streamlined lending products, and just the tightening of those. Um, their lending appetite, because there seems to be a tightening of the lending appetite. There's uh, uh, the, what their attitude is going to continue to be to uh, the balance scorecard payments that used to be uh, around volume bonus uh, trail, and we're getting some good responses on trail uh, that, uh, that by and large trail will continue. <laughs> You've just thrown a bit of jargon in, and when I guess not everybody's a finance broker. What's the balance scorecard? The uh, in addition to uh, th there's basically a a, a payment that uh, some broking firms and aggregating uh, businesses get uh, based on quality and uh, and profitability of of the book. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that there is we, we're having some liaison and some dialogue about continuing that because. That's very much dependent on volume of business, and if, if business volumes fall off a cliff, then that income stream also falls off a cliff. Um, and given that, you know, sixty-eight percent of all business, commercial business, is written through intermediaries of some sort, um, the we are very, very much the distribution channel of all those commercial products. So, uh, you know, it's important for big business, the banks, to support smaller business, which is the broking businesses, uh, through a time where you know we're going through an unprecedented. Uh, amount of uh, business disruption. So uh, we've been talking to the banks. That's one of the eight key points that we've been talking to the banks and lenders about uh, where they can assist us in um, uh, like an assistance package to to uh, to help all of our members. But that's not one, that's probably not the key one. Uh, you know, the main ones are around just our ability to continue to do business uh, and where you've got uh, six month deferrals of uh, repayments, which I'm a huge supporter of, uh, you don't also want the banks to then say, well, hang on, these people are in hardship because they're not. Uh, they're just being yeah. prudent. You don't want them to, to pull back on their lending facilities or on their existing limits on their on these businesses' ability to borrow and expand or to uh, fulfil contracts or purchases uh, when, in fact, uh, all they're doing is being prudent. Um, and the other one, just in day-to-day -day kind of administrative things or, or procedural things like, you know, how do you go and identify uh, a new customer when you would normally go and see them face to face in an environment where you can't come, can't do that at the moment. So, uh, new and rules. How do you do that? Uh, well, um, uh, Oztrack have had to sign off on some new rules, but uh, the ability to, uh, you know, uh, meet somebody via Skype, <clears throat> pardon me, and there's a whole series of protocols about how you do that um, so that you can identify the person and their driver's license um, on screen and uh, a number of questions that you need to ask them. So, there's new protocols and procedures around. Uh, making sure that we can do that. So that's some of the stuff that's been keeping me busy. I've been doing some media and I've, I've been uh, in, in response to um, those sorts of issues. Uh, I've been liaising with um, Anna Bly quite a bit from the Bankers Association. What we're finding is, is there's a lot of 
problem in the ter- in terms of translation of policy. So right. at executive level and at ABA level, um, some fantastic policies are put into train, uh, but at operational level, the detail doesn't seem to get down to, uh, or at a procedural level, quite often it's difficult for the banks to uh, put these things into place or they simply don't have a system to put these things into place or the intent of the policy isn't properly translated like, you know, the banks want to lend money but at the credit desk there's still that sort of tightening of credit. Um, so uh, I talk to people like Anna and then she in turn talk, talks to bank CEOs. They in turn get on the phone to me and we have a bit of a chat about, you know, what's happening, that, that disconnect between board level and street level um, so that yeah. we try to resolve some of those kinds of issues. Um, and then in the process of all of that, uh, because I'm on the board of COSBOA, the Council of Small Business Associations of Australia, uh, they get a lot of media inquiries and anything to do with finance is, is often directed to me. Um, so I've been speaking to um, 2GB and AW and I've had columns in uh, uh, the Daily Telegraph and Herald Sun around oh, the country. I saw you in the Daily Telegraph and, uh, geez, you're getting some googlies and curveballs there, I thought... Uh, yeah, but, but you handled them. Uh, yeah, you handled them really well. I mean, I think you were expected to be a bit of a tax accountant, and uh, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't in your immediate valley week. But uh, I was it, impressed. It wasn't that was my- wasn't in my immediate purview at all. But I, I mean, just just between you and I, um, I had uh, two uh, research officers on the phone at the same time, so it was like phone. I was friend. worrying about that. <laughs> yeah. Is that every Wednesday, David, or has it just been the last couple? Uh, it's been, um, it was two for, uh, two Wednesdays a fortnight apart, and we may continue to do that. It's just a matter of um, how how many more questions come up about that. But originally they, they said, will you answer questions about finance? But the finance, I guess, topic questions seem to come under, you know, job keeper, job seeker, uh, traineeships, yeah. apprenticeships and payments, those sorts of things. But we do have okay. contacts with the tax office and we can research these uh uh, these problems. So, uh, you know, we are still a very good, good conduit to raise those sorts of issues. All right. Um, okay, well, we'll just uh, we'll just bring uh, bring uh, Aaron Donald in. G'day, Aaron. How are you going? Good, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. And what's uh, what's keep, been keeping you busy? Well, I mean, WA is obviously propping up the rest of the nation's economy, um, so I uh, couldn't help but get that in to uh, some eastern staters, but... Um, I'm a dispute resolution lawyer, Nick, so I focus on helping clients avoid and resolve disputes so they can focus on other things. And disputes are obviously counter-cyclical, so when times are tough, as they are now, the number of disputes, people trying to recover money, is increased. So we've been pretty busy with that sort of stuff, um, advising landlords and tenants in relation to the recent code, um, advising in relation to employment disputes, um, debt debt recovery, um, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it's a well, pretty wide gambit. It's interesting. I, I guess um, in this environment, uh, when it comes to collecting money, uh, there's a there's a delay on the statutory demand uh, period now. But yeah. also, I guess there's there's an appearances thing as well. People don't want to appear to be, uh, you know, mean in this in this environment. I mean, how are you how are you advising? people to, uh, I mean, well, well, the way you are advising people in dispute, how's that changed uh, the way things are now, given given those circumstances? Yeah, that certainly happened, Nick. Um, I do some work for a liquidator who'd asked me to, just on the precipice of when COVID started, to recover some money for him. And then I was sort of, I just sent him an email over the week and asked for more information. And they said, they sent me an email back saying, we've actually decided, in light of the current circumstances, we're just going to leave this alone until over Dover. So I thought that was um, quite commendable if you can, if parties can do that. I think, but on the yeah. other side of the chain, landlords, um, I think, really sort of need to come to the party with their tenant. So otherwise, they're going to be um, left without a tenant if they don't provide some sort of relief. Um, you make the point about the statutory demand process, the bankruptcy notice period, they've been extended out and so you don't really have to worry about stuff and there's going to be no presumptions of insolvency. So um, I think people are sort of willing to kick it down the road, even the people that are, the, 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 the debtors that are required to pay the amounts are willing to kick it down the road a bit until this all ends. Um, so, 
Yeah, it's a bit of a, bit of a mixed reaction. Other people, I've, I've had other clients where we've issued the statutory demands prior to this new six-month period kicking in, and um, they're keen to still continue to enforce. But sorry, and one point I should make is that the courts are, are slowing down so much, Nick, that um, you can't, you're doing everything by video and telephone at the moment when you're giving appearances. Um, and 97% of disputes resolved by some form of consensus like a mediation. So what the advice I'm giving to clients is the fact that it's going to be slowed down um, even more is an even greater impetus to try and resolve it and just get some sort of deal you can live with. Right. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to the uh, the landlord issue because yep. there's... Uh, there's there's, there's one of the headlines that we'll get to, and there's a couple of different perspectives on that that I'm interested in uh, hearing uh, from you a little bit later. You, you, were, you said you're involved in, uh, in some M&A work at the moment? Yeah, I've um, been advising on a, a big mining transaction, so which requires FERB approval as well. So we got an email from FERB, as you're probably aware, saying um, um, we're not going to be really looking at anything until September. And... This same client's actually entered into a transaction to buy, um, uh, entered into another mining transaction. And and because the thresholds have been lowered to zero dollars now, um, circumstances where it wouldn't have been a notifiable event, has it's now become a notifiable event. And so it's really slowing, it's slowing those sorts of transactions down. So th that's been right. something I've been working on as well. Yeah, is that across the board, Aaron? That uh, So is it fair to say that m is where there is a, a foreign buyer uh, are being, uh, I guess, put put on ice because of this yeah. foreign investment review board. Yeah, I spoke to um, a liquidator this week who's in the middle of a transaction um, which requires FERB approval and it's um, subject to a deed of company arrangement and he said that the only the condition precedent to enabling the transaction to proceed was the FERB approval and because of it being pushed back to September, yeah. Um, the proponent in the docker is going to have to fund the whole uh, administration up until September. So um, you have to query sort of the economic rationale. Okay. All right. Well, look, uh, we're going to uh, bring in uh, uh, Glenn Treble. Uh, G'day, Glenn. How are you going? Yeah, well, Nick, how are you? Fantastic. What's been keeping you busy this week? We've just been keeping in contact with our clients, I suppose, one of the things that we do in headhunting, as you said, Nick, and, and I don't take offence to that at all, uh, is very much around uh, making sure that our clients have got the right people in the right places. It's difficult to be in recruitment at the moment because, you know, it's affected us greatly. One of the first things to drop off uh, in, in anyone's interests is to bring new people on into this section. So I think with uh, some of our clients, they've been particularly strategic around, okay, there's talent out there that we've never had access to. And, and that's a real key to, uh, to the clever businesses that they've, they've known people in the marketplace that they've never had access to previously and now they've got access to them because they've just been uh, let go of their existing employer uh, or uh, the hours have been reduced. So... The, the opportunity is huge for clients at the moment. I mean, what Glenn's saying is that, I say it's counterintuitive, they're seeing, Glenn's seeing this as a, a market where you can actually, if I can just use some words you were using earlier, to actually um, get the jump on your competitors. You're saying if people sitting at home, uh, I'm sure they're working, aren't they? Uh, but they're sitting at home and you're seeing them as being um, vulnerable pickings. So do, just talk us through that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It um, some of the some of the better people to go. Um, it, it's a classic scenario in business: is the last one in is the first one out when uh, when there's a downturn. And we've found some of the people in the marketplace and the talent that's available right now is truly extraordinary. Um, and it's it's not because they're bad, you know, they're they're bad staff. It was just a bad situation that they got themselves in. So, um, yeah, we, we're, we're putting those type of people forward. You know, they're, they're some of the best salespeople in the marketplace if we're looking at uh, some of the areas that we work in effectively, which is technology, hospitality, travel, 
uh, those, those markets are going to come back and the ones that have got the best talent are the ones that are going to be the most effective to get up to speed again. And what, and what uh, I guess, what's the most common press call you're getting this week, Glenn? Um, look, we do sit in the hospitality and travel sector. Uh, so, you know, we, we within the business, uh, I think it was last week, actually had phone calls uh, with three individuals from three of our clients. And amongst them, there were 8,000 staff that they had to let go. Uh, they're difficult phone calls to take. Yeah. Uh, especially when there's a certain amount of those staff that you've put in place. So it becomes personal. Are you getting asked to make those phone calls or...? I not not with the not with the uh, not with those ones, but that's that's definitely something that we've helped with previously. Sticking on the okay. um, half glass full uh, point that you made earlier, Nick, and what you were saying earlier, Glenn, um, that point you make about opportunity and trying to um, pick opportunities now reminds me of that old Warren Buffett line: um, "Be fearful when others are greedy." and be greedy when others are fearful. Oh, that's a, okay. All right, you're going for the one-liner of the week. <laughs> I just wanted to actually, uh, I'll just go around and ask you another question. Is David, one of the uh, one of the parts of the stimulus uh, that, the, the, that the government's introduced uh, has been this accelerated tax write-off. So, um, you know, rather than have to depreciate assets of what, up to $150,000, you can get an instant write-off. Are, right. are you seeing much? It's a temporary increase of the instant asset write-off from $30,000 to $150,000, but it's only up until the 30th of June, and it's uh, it's to encourage people to go out and spend money, which ironically um, the banks are not helping you to do if they're tightening up on their credit policies. Um, they, right. I think it's a, as an industry body, it's actually something we've been pushing to, we, we've been pushing for an investment allowance for some time. So, uh, and it's, and we know that a change in tax behaviour through fiscal policy uh, is far more effective than a drop in interest rates through monetary policy. So, yeah, it's, it's a good idea, except that at the moment, no one really is spending any money or buying anything yeah. that they, they didn't previously have on order. Uh, so, I don't think it's encouraging a lot of new spending, um, but yeah. there are people who are certainly taking advantage of it. Um, if, you, if perhaps you were going to buy a ute or a forklift or a new work vehicle or something like that, you know, in July, August, September, you might now bring it forward to June and claim it all as a tax deduction. And if, if you buy a $50,000 vehicle, then that's going to write off, um, you know, a lot of tax. So uh, that's, yeah. you know, it's a good thing to go and do. But I wouldn't say that it's actually changing behaviour. Uh, and it's not as good an inducement as uh, perhaps it's, well, it's not as, as good an assistance package, perhaps as uh, the ability to defer loan payments or the two hundred fifty thousand um, dollar government back loan that people have, have been taking, or JobKeeper or the other uh, packages. But bear in mind, uh, also, Aaron, it was stimulus for round one, and uh, round one things really changed between round one, two, and three. Yeah. Okay. Aaron, are you, are you getting clients talking about these uh, stimulus measures? The, the, the not so much. I mean, job, job keep has been a big one. Um, I was aware of the um, instant asset write off and the increase in that, but I haven't had clients approach me about that. But um, one thing I did notice, and I was surprised, was in relation to job keeper. Was the old, I've been waiting to hear what the alternative test is. So if you fall into right. one of those businesses that isn't. Um, uh, um, last year doesn't look like this year and you've had a growth period or you've gone through a drought or something like that. Um, the, the, the Effectively what the legislation did is it allowed the commissioner to determine what the policy would be there. And the commissioner only released, as far as I'm aware, the commissioner only released what the policy was in the last 24 hours or so. So trying to grapple with that to understand um, who's going to fall into it, who's going to fall out. I think I think that change was today. The alternative, right. it uh, and they look quite positive. I, do, I think I think the 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 way that it was set up to start, it needed to have more flexibility. Mm. Uh, look, I think the overarching directive from Treasury is that you're going to help people, and, uh, yeah. and Chris Jordan's very much taken that on board. And the Deputy Commissioner in charge of that area, uh, Deborah Jenkins, is fantastic and uh, 
and she certainly it, it might and i've had some opportunity to speak to her and um and she what she's saying is uh, without my quoting her is uh, you know they'll look at everything uh, so everybody has the opportunity to actually talk to the tax office even if they don't necessarily fit the parameters all right i'm getting uh, my producer is saying to uh, get onto the headlines so, <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll do that um and listen the first one here is uh, is one that uh, i think there's a couple of interesting angles i i, I know that, that, that west australians have a little bit of interest in uh, in, in rugby but I was interested from uh, from your point of view, Glenn, as a as a, a you know a C suite um, a C suite recruitment person. Uh, how would you like the job of recruiting uh, for, uh, for for rugby Australia? Uh, look, we've we've done a certain amount of recruiting in the sporting arena over the years, and we always enjoy it. It's uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's a high profile one. We uh, we we get caught up in a few high profile hires, and they're always good fun. Um, somewhat of a challenge for uh, for Raylene to continue holding that role, though. I think. Um, yeah, Phil well, she's got uh, yeah. <laughs> Phil Cairns is, is another outstanding candidate, I think. But uh, yeah, finding the right person in the market is most probably a little easier right now. David, oh, well, uh, rugby league, I don't really understand it, but I would have thought, from a recruiting point of view, if you didn't have more than a twelve-month guarantee, to be the ideal ideal gig, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, you go. You go. All right, I, I threw that one in because it was uh, it was very topical. Uh, I'll go to our next one. Yeah, okay, so this takes us just a step back to where we were before. Banks get hurry up as businesses cling on. When I turned on the TV last night, um, the government was kind of complaining a little bit about the job keeper. The idea is that, you know, you're meant to hang on to your staff and keep paying your staff and the, and the government's going to, to tip some money in. And I think the, the government was envisaging that the, um, that the banks would just extend overdrafts and what have you, but David, I saw you on one of your uh, one of your videos the other day. You were saying the banks are pushing a lot of the admin on the finance brokers. How's the admin for this going? Do you think uh, it was probably the most common question when I was doing the uh, the online thing for uh, Two GB and uh, uh, no, sorry for uh, for News Corp. Um, the it, it, the people simply don't have the cash flow, and there's a lot of businesses that have actually closed that um, that want to retain their staff and use JobKeeper to do it. So. Uh, it's become a real problem. You can't just go and raid your super, uh, and that's only going to give you $10,000 anyway. Um, so uh, the short answer is that there's no short answer. The the, uh, the banks have had to be a lot more um, forthcoming than they've been, which is why ScoMo got onto them about yesterday and literally read the riot act to them, and there's been some action on it today, which is what this is about, and a couple of other articles in The Australian Today. Yeah. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think, Aaron? Are you, are you, do you see any sort of liability there from on the banks if they don't? If someone goes bust, you know, uh, and they wouldn't have gone bust if they would have got the job, you know, if they don't get that bridging, is there any issue there? I think a, a couple of things on this. One of the classic indicators of in, of insolvency is the inability to be able to get your overdraft extended or to get further credit from the bank, mm. and that legal test is changing because of. COVID-19, that remains the legal test. So that's something to bear in mind. It's one of the classic tests that Liquidator will look at to determine whether or not a company's insolvent. I think, obviously, the banks have had a pretty rough 24 months of the Royal Commission, and they need to be doing everything they can at the moment to be um, restoring their position. I, I actually was laughing at somebody the other day that my bank manager had called me, um, and he's never rung me in his life. Um, uh, only, only when I ring him to borrow money or something like that, you know, he, he was ringing me and he just called just to check in to see if I was going all right. So I think they're working hard on improving their image, and this doesn't help. Can I? I just, you raise a very, very good point there about the Royal Commission. Um, it's that it's made the banks very risk averse, um, and they're they're petrified of making any credit decisions, even in the commercial space, and all. The findings in the Royal Commission were around the consumer space, not the commercial space, and that was round three, and, and Hain was very clear about it. But they're, with the banking code of practice, they're petrified of making decisions that aren't seen as responsible. Now, if you're not trading all that well at the moment and the bank is lending you $250,000 or advancing you money, are they being responsible? So they're scared of that. Uh, but at the same time, they also don't have processes in place. So the this this 
this policy is put in place, this decision to lend is put in place, um, and there's a response that they need, if they don't have the process or if their processing centre is in the Philippines or in Bangalore and they're in lockdown, they don't have the capacity. Um, and uh, so the, the, the some of the banks have been way better at this than others, um, and a couple of them have been terrible at it. So uh, what it's highlighted is their inflexibility and their inability to... Um, to respond in an emergency. I, I think I've said before on this, uh, you've got to distinguish between the bank and the banker. I think the bankers are doing their best. It's, it's, it's very hard on them, but um, particularly when they're villains, you know, one minute and, and uh, everyone's trying to make them into heroes the next. But we'll go on to the next, uh, the next headline. And uh, this, um, this is the one on, on, uh, re on rents. And uh, Aaron, you were saying a bit earlier about um, uh, landlords showing a bit of clemency. But uh, this article here uh, has a couple of case studies, and one of them is where there's a, there's a petrol station. And the petrol sp station is owned by retiree investors who are obviously relying on that rent uh, for their own income. Um, yeah. In this particular example, you know, the petrol station is going like gangbusters. Everyone, you know, there, there, there hasn't been any... They're, they're, their revenues, I think it's saying that their sales are up, uh, and yet they're looking for rent cuts. So uh, I guess it plays both ways. Are you seeing both sides of that equation? Yeah, I am. I, I think in that circumstance, landlords need to be savvy and not roll over. I mean, obviously, if you're asking your property manager for rent relief or you're trying to get in under the, the code of conduct, you've got to produce your financials. You've got to be able to show that you have had this declinature in your in your revenue. So the numbers don't lie. Um, and if, they, if the numbers aren't there, then... I'd be encouraging landlords to um, offer, uh, take up a more robust approach. But there certainly are people doing that in the market, Nick. Yeah. Taking advantage, you mean? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And I think I think um, the other thing, to, I mean, there's obviously very different landlords, but um, the large you know, retail shopping centre landlords are obviously coming to the table and, and doing things, but... It's the retirees using the self-managed super fund that I think are the ones that are um, being a bit more difficult to negotiate with. And I, I've certainly had a fair few calls about that sort of stuff. Um, spoke to somebody yesterday that um, says the landlord isn't isn't budging and, and they've been required to close. I wonder, uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned shopping centres there and I wonder, Glenn, uh, just in the in your sort of client base, I just wonder about the future of shop, shopping centres. Um, do, do any of your clients uh, talk talk about um, you know I guess changing this? this I, I mean, I think there was a trend. I, I worried about shopping centres before this came along. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a real concern. Uh, we as a business spoke to one of our clients this week, and it was a florist, uh, CBD based florist. Uh, had 10 staff, now has two staff, and, and the challenge is actually paying all the bills that are still coming in because as a florist in the CBD, you can imagine that when it's full, things are pretty good. Um, when there's no one in there to actually buy flowers, it's terribly difficult. And the biggest bill right now is rent. Um, and, and, you know, the majority of the owners in there are going to be your larger owners, but not all of them are that way. They're not all sitting there as uh, as as very very wealthy landlords. Some of them also, um, you know, still have to pay the bills. So yeah. di well, difficult exactly. time, difficult times all round. Yeah. Okay. We'll move on to the next one here. Now, this one here, uh, this is a bit of a wish question. So, uh, the last, this this uh, topic has ended um, the, the discourse now that big reform is needed. Uh, and I think they're talking about big tax reform. Uh, um, I, they're, they're talking here, I think, David. Uh, actually, David, when you said before about you've been pushing for investment allowance, I, I wanted to have a dig and say that I, I think that brokers have, looked, have been pushing for investment allowances ever, ever, ever since the, uh, I've been involved in finance. But um, this 30% bring down of the company tax rate, what, what, um, what, do you think, what do you think about, firstly, what do you think about bringing down the company tax rate? And if you had one wish, if you rub the uh, genie lamp and you had one wish, what would be the one reform you'd like to see government bringing? I'll start with you, David. Um, okay, well, the tax rate down to 30%, I'd like to see it, you know, probably around 25. And I think that's the government's ultimate agenda is to get it down there and have it competitive with, uh, with other economies and, and um, jurisdictions in the region because uh, you can't attract 
uh, investment into Australia if you're competing with companies like Singapore that throw money at you uh, to get uh, started and then have a lower company tax rate. So uh, so that's one. Um, and uh, the genie is, uh, is simply regulation. Uh, right. You can't regulate people into uh, being able to uh, do business. Um, Education is important. Uh, regulation is uh, uh, every every layer of regulation uh, adds a cost um, and um, and adds an impediment. So, do you, uh, do you mean compliance or just yeah, just compliance? Yeah. There's, yeah. Um, there's there's way too much compliance, and I mean, you know, our we're in, in an industry which is absolutely overladen with uh, compliance, and uh, and ultimately, I've never and Nick, you and I have known each other a long time. Neither of us has ever had a client who's asked for more hoops to jump through or more regulations to have to comply with, or more forms to fill out. They want to be able to get on with running their business and not being told how to do it. So uh, uh, they want, you know, they want protections, certainly, and they want reasonable contract terms, but they don't want uh, uh, regulation around credit. You know, certainly, uh, yeah, I mean, my personal view is that, you know, we're all grown-ups and you should be able to take your own decisions and take take your own medicine. But uh, um, what, what, what about yourself, Aaron? If you had, uh, if you were in the room with the Treasurer and the, and the Prime Minister and there was one thing that you thought would, would free up business and, and help help stimulate more jobs, what, what would you ask them for? Um, I think that's a really good one. I see that the article references a great Western Australian in Nev Bauer. Um, who's certainly a conservative, which will do everything he can to reduce the bureaucracy on small businesses. One thing that I think that really is overdue, and it's not a Commonwealth issue, but it is a state issue, is the payroll tax and mm. removing um, or increasing the thresholds on that. I note that in Western Australia, we pay more payroll tax than the other states, but they've recently um, fast-forwarded the increase in the threshold, so you pay less payroll tax. I think that's a bit of a tax on the economy. They're certainly going to have to do something, I think, about the company tax rate or something similar when this is over because they're going to need a lot of stimulus. Yeah, payroll tax is the biggest challenge, I think, that we've got at the moment. Even if it was just a minor change, payroll tax is one of those things that really needs to be looked at. Um, people have been looking at that for the last 20 years and shaking their heads in New South Wales. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Right. You've got to weigh that against the economic cost of... Being able to employ more people if you're paying less in payroll tax and where the where that money would ultimately flow in the economy and the benefit it would provide it's a growth tax that just doesn't make sense the yeah. more you grow the more you're going to get taxed on employing people why is that yeah. so wrong yeah. particularly when you cross the threshold uh, um we've had these plunging oil prices and uh one of the one of the news articles there is electricity prices are at four years at four year lows I just wonder, are low energy prices um, assisting any of your clients, David? Oh, we're very heavily focused on manufacturing. I mean, uh, we provide finance to capital intensive businesses. So uh, uh, a lot of those are in transport, logistics, distribution, manufacturing. So uh, fuel costs and energy costs are, uh, you know, aside from rent and wages, are probably their biggest costs. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Fuel uh, and and those things flow on to every they're passed on uh, and flow on to everything that they do. So uh, absolutely, the, a reduction in fuel cost or in energy costs uh, benefits everybody. And what, uh, Aaron, uh, is there much talk? Obviously, uh, WA is all about mining um, and and transport, I suppose. Uh, and yeah, I agree with David there. I think that um, it's certainly welcomed. We have a Labor government here in Western Australia, and that's a big part of their agenda, reducing electricity prices. And I know that they have provided some sort of relief to people in relation to uh, since COVID-19. But um, if you can reduce the price of petrol at the Bowser, I think it's it's all good stuff. And it uh, promotes the economy. Well, your trucks have got a lot of distance to, uh, to travel over there, that's for sure. If you yeah, up, well, I spoke, uh, I've got a, a large logistics client and I rang him because one of the things I've been doing is trying to ring important clients to, touch base to make sure they're all right and I actually thought he'd be going really well um, but um, uh, he's, he, he relies on the big mining contracts and the oil and gas projects which are sort of slowing down a bit. Um, his biggest client was just 30% of his revenue said to hold off for another four or five months so um, he's really hurting. I guess this one, um, second wave of mega project Silver Bullet to revive the New South Wales economy. Um, so there's, I guess being Australia, we always want uh, infrastructure to, to lift us out of where we're at. 
Um, is there talk of infrastructure in, in Victoria, David, and is, uh, is that getting people excited about buying yellow goods and what have you? I, I cannot step out of my office door without tripping over infrastructure, which is fantastic. No. So, And this is one of the things that's, that, that is going to be the difference between how we come out of this and how we come out of the uh, how we came out of the GFC and out of the early '90s recession. So, uh, the difference now is that interest rates are really, really low, and everywhere around Australia, there's massive interest infrastructure projects. And on top of that, and it was a tragedy, but we had the bushfires, and there's going to be the re we we don't yet have the rebuilding program from the bushfires, which is largely largely paid for by insurance or government. So, uh, you've got these infrastructure project projects which are paid for by government or by uh, investment. Um, and so, yeah, they absolutely will keep a lot of uh, yellow goods uh, turning and uh, contractors, civil contractors and uh, private enterprise and uh, small businesses uh, functioning. So there's, you know, there's all of that work is still going. It's ongoing. And there's projects lining up <clears throat> behind projects. So this is going to help to pull us out of this economic slump that we're currently, this J thing that we're currently in, this V curve. Let's call it that, the V curve. And I know that uh, finance brokers love uh, love a nice chunky bit of uh, metal to, uh, oh. to to finance. Look, we're we're, we're running out of time. Uh, we won't we won't go into uh, uh, into this into this virgin thing. God knows where it's got up to while we've been talking. Um, um, we'll 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 wrap up there. So just just before we do, I just wonder if any of you've got any questions for each other at all. No, I, I do have a question to you, Nick, as to why this. Walkley award-winning service isn't on Sky TV yet. Well, you know, look, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm fielding offers. That's all I'll say. Yeah, that's a, that's a, the money's just not good enough yet. It'll get exactly. Yeah. No, but I don't have any questions. Um, great to meet you, David and Glenn. Thanks very much for having me, Nick. And likewise, no. thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah, all thanks, right. guys. All right. Well, we'll look. Uh, okay, we'll look. We'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, to David, Aaron, and Glenn, and uh, they've, they've brought some very uh, interesting perspectives to a few of the different uh, topics of the day. Uh, thank you very much to those that uh, that have uh, watched us live, and um, thank you to everybody who's uh, watched us perhaps over the weekend at their leisure. So uh, have a great weekend, everybody, and thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much for having us.